This is Duke University. Uh, thank you, everybody, uh, for joining us this afternoon. Uh, I'm Sally Kornbluth, provost of the university. Um, so you're about to hear a conversation today on a topic that touches all of us involved in higher education. How can America's system of higher learning best serve our nation's young people and prepare them to be the scholars, leaders, and innovators that the world needs? So before we get into the conversation, I want to take a moment to tell you something about our honored guest, educational innovator, innovator Kathy Ann Davidson. Kathy is well known to quite a number of you from her two decades at Duke as the Ruth F. Devarney Professor of English and the Franklin Humanities Institute Professor of Interdisciplinary Studies. From 1998 to 2006, she also served as Duke's Vice Provost for Interdisciplinary Studies. This was the first position of this kind, both at Duke and in the nation. So uh, Kathy was really a pioneer. She's also the founding director, along with Carla Holloway, of the Franklin Humanities Institute. Kathy is currently a distinguished pr professor in the PhD program in English at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. A renowned scholar of cultural history and technology, Kathy has written about the history of the book, the history of industrialism and post-industrialism, digital humanities, and the impact of new technologies on culture, cognition, learning, and the workplace. She's the founding director of the Futures Initiative, co-director of the CUNY Humanities Alliance, and co-director of Haystack, the Humanities, Arts, Science, and Technology Alliance and Collaboratory. In 2011, President Obama appointed Kathy to the National Council on the Humanities. Among her many honors are Educator of the Year from the World Technology Network and the Ernest J. Boyer Award for Significant Contributions to Higher Education. She has published more than 20 books. Her latest published last, last month is the reason we're here today, and there's a stack over there, and I know you'll be happy to interact with people uh, during the reception. So let me share a couple of quotes from the reviewers of the new education, how to revolutionize the university to prepare students for a world in flux. First, from the Washington Post. Quote, Davidson writes in the tradition of Dubois and Dewey, a pragmatist tradition that puts inquiry first and sees learning through the potential of the full complex human being students can become. If the new education is to be successful, whatever its use of technology, it will build on this tradition as teachers and students make it their own, adapting it to the changing times. And from Inside Higher Ed, Davidson's new book is a manifesto on teaching students and institutions how to survive and thrive in the digital age. So please join me in welcome, welcoming Kathy uh, and Ed for this conversation. So you may have noticed, those of you who've come in, that there uh, is some paper and uh, a pencil uh, on your seat. And I just want to uh, uh, first just mention that we're going to have a, an interlude uh, after Kathy and I engage in, in some conversation um, uh, for audience participation. So that's, that's coming down the track. And after that, we'll move on to some, some questions and answers uh, involving the audience as well. Um, so, uh, Kathy, this, this new volume, uh, The New Education, uh, provides analysis and uh, prescriptions for higher education that reflect decades of experience <laughs> as a researcher. Many decades. <laughs> and a teacher and someone very much involved with civic engagement. Um, the key premise of the book is that our current structure of higher education is outmoded. I wonder if we could start by you giving us a sense of what you mean by that. In the United States, between about 1860 and 1925, the historic elite Puritan college was totally changed. And if I were to list all of the things that didn't really exist in any institutional way before 1860, but that were fully in place by 1925, there's not a single one I'd have to explain to anybody because they're exactly the structure we have today. Majors, minors, professional school, graduate school, credit hours, um, distribution requirements, general education requirements, the ability to choose your professor, um, things that we think of as the better divisions, science division, humanities division, social science, new. Social science is very new at this time. Lee Baker knows this in the audience. Um, what's interesting is almost all of this was invented, spearheaded, by one very influential person and his colleagues, and that was Charles Eliot, 
Uh, Charles Eliot was a, a graduate of Harvard, as had been his father and his grandfather and his great grandfather, et cetera, et cetera. He was a, a theoretical chemist. He didn't. He had a trust fund. He didn't want to make money as a college professor, and that's a good thing because nobody did. If you taught at Harvard uh, in the 1860s, it was because you had a trust fund. You didn't need. It was a gentleman's profession, literally. There were not women, of course, in higher education, then, uh, at least not at those at the elite um, Ivy League schools, and. Um, his father lost everything in the Panic of 1857, and suddenly Charles Eliot had to earn a living. And many people throughout the world were blaming the world's first worldwide financial crisis on poor American education. Americans were great inventors, great technologists, and they felt that Americans were naive about how the world worked. So Charles Eliot actually inherited another little bit of money from a grandfather and took it and went to Europe and studied the European system and came back to America determined to change the American education system. He wrote an, um, a famous article in Atlantic Monthly called, not coincidentally, The New Education, which is the same as my book, because I'm basically saying we need a new education for now. But um, he was only 34, and he wrote a scathing critique of the Puritan college. Uh, answering the question, what shall I do with my boy? A friend said, what shall I do with my boy? He doesn't want to be a minister. He doesn't want to be a college professor. There's no place to send him. And Elliot said, you're right. There's no place to send him. We have to change everything. Harvard was going through a crisis at the time. Um, Elliot was at the time teaching at a brand new, radical, exciting university at Polytechnic on the European novel called MIT, uh, on the European model called MIT. Um, and Harvard said, come from MIT and be our president. So at 35, Eliot became president and was president for 40 years. And he and his friends basically created the modern university and they created the credentialing, ranking, and credentialing system that put the university they were inventing, which is basically Harvard, um, as the pinnacle and everything else judged by against that. So even though US, the United States famously does not have a system of higher education, we have a ranking system, which is always hierarchical, continues to this day, and basically says every, I think my, uh, every university has to somehow be compared with the, most, the wealthiest, most elite universities in the country. So it's, that's true for admissions. It's true for faculty. It's true for all of the ways we credential, have a system of hierarchy built in which goes all the way back to actually the 1890s. So, so a key argument in the book is that this system that emerged fit in many ways the needs of the country uh, in the late 19th, early 20th century, and maybe even after that to some extent, but, but not so much anymore. And I wonder if you could explain sure. what you mean by that. The big problem of the 19th century for mandatory public schooling, K through 12, is how you turn farmers into factory workers. And the big problem, this is a simplification, it's schematic, big problem of higher education is how you turn shopkeepers into corporate middle managers, how you create a new professional managerial class. Right? So before, if you wanted to be a lawyer, you went to secondary schooling, and you some, didn't even really need to go through four years of college. You went right to a kind of apprenticeship as a law, a law school. So in law school. So all of that apparatus to make and define and certify a professional managerial class has to come um, to the fore when you're a country that's gone from basically an agrarian country to an industrial superpower, a colonizing powerful superpower. So it's preparing for a whole world of new professions. Most of those professions have gone through some pretty cataclysmic changes since April 22nd, 1993. That's the day that the scientists from the uh, uh, National Center for Supercomputing Applications at the University of Illinois came out and said, we're going to make the Mosaic 1.0 browser free to the world as a public good. Anyone now who has a computer can have an internet connection that from this day forth can connect you to anyone else who has an internet connection. And at that moment, there were about 20 websites in existence, and they were used by scientists. By the end of 1993, there were 10,000 websites in existence. And basically, over that time period to the present, we have gone through as cataclysmic a redistribution of goods, labor, ideas, 
um, uh, materials, humans, uh, democracies and infiltrations of democracies in ways every bit is cataclysmic, every bit is cataclysmic as a steam power and the attendant social reorganization that happens in the change from a basically agrarian to a basically industrialized economy. But we have not remotely gone through the same kind of cataclysmic rethinking of what it means to train people for professions when you're inventing professions versus what you're doing in a world where who knows what profession is going to collapse tomorrow, right? Does anyone? Anyone who thinks that they know what skills will serve students when they graduate from college or at the end of their careers, which would be something like, what, 2060, 2070? I mean, if you know what, what the world is going to be like in 2070, most people didn't know what the world was going to be like on November 7, 2016, right? And we're facing issues that nobody could have imagined. Right? I mean, I've read a lot of the archives um, from uh, the 1990s about what the world was going to be like. We don't have jetpacks, right? We're not all flying around in jetpacks, although we do have drones. Uh, but nobody would have thought about a president tweeting every morning. Or the possibility of hackers from Russia hacking into our system, right? Or the possibility that you could be a cab driver. Well, that's a profession that's never going to change, right? And suddenly, a whole new redistribution distribution system comes so that Uber is putting you out of work as a taxi driver, right? In other words, these are changes that are un predictable, unimaginable changes. So when people say that the thing we have to do now is skills training, that is so cynical. Everybody knows skills training is just going to make you obsolete even faster than anything else. Right? Specific, defined, finite skills are, make you incredibly vulnerable in the world we're living in now. So you've already intimated that a, a crucial pivot point for you in thinking about the difference, the different world that we confront now than, say, the mid-20th century is this massive set of revolutions unleashed by information technology. You, in the book, uh, make clear your position on technology and higher education with two chapter titles. <laughs> so the first is against technophobia, and the second is against technophilia. So you're looking for the Goldilocks, the Goldilocks strategy of just right in between the two. I wonder if you could reflect a little bit on what that looks like. Yeah, um, I named those chapters with those titles because, wow, a lot of stupid stuff has been said about technology. And a lot of stupid stuff has been said about how if you just in technologize everything, learning is going to be free. I mean, Thomas Friedman, the great American journalist Thomas Friedman, said about MOOCs, do you remember those back in 2012? Massive online open courseware. I taught one of the first ones here at Duke. I was asked to teach one on the history of future of higher education, and I talk about this at length in the book. Thomas Friedman said MOOCs would not only make education free and universal, it would end global poverty. That kind of hasn't happened since 2013. Um, at the same time, the people who say the internet has made all young people, I mean, there's some people in this audience who, how many people in this audience were born after 1993. Okay. It's a lot of you, right? Um, you don't have a before and, a af and after. You grew up with the internet. And there are a lot of pundits who are my age saying, all of you, every one of you, you're distracted. Uh, you have no self control. You're alienated. You're um, uh, antisocial. Uh, I mean, that's crazy. That's exactly the same thing, and this is not coincidental, that Thomas Jefferson said about the novel uh, at, in, right after the time of the Constitution. So my, one of my first books was on technology and the last information age. What happened when mass printing suddenly made books and magazines available to the working classes for the first time. And Jefferson and John, John Adams and others said, oh my god, this, people can read anything? They're not just hearing a, a, a minister talk from the podium? They can read on their own? They can read garbage? They can read novels? Sensational, sentimental 
gothic novels, this is going to make them distracted. It's going to make them lonely. It's going to make them antisocial. It's going to lead to licentiousness. There's almost nothing people have said about modern technology that wasn't said about that past technology. So I'm very skeptical of the technology will destroy everything. And I'm equally skeptical of this technology is going to solve all the problems. What I think we need is an education that makes us a whole lot smarter about what technology does and doesn't do. And I think the people who most need to read this book are those people at the D School at Stanford and who are going straight to Silicon Valley who have not quite figured out that the technologies they're inventing have some really, really big problems, right? Really big problems. And the billion dollars we spend every year um, simply from ransom paid to hackers is nothing compared to what can come in the future. I'm, I don't know if that was in the introduction. I'm on the board of directors of Mozilla, the inventors of the Firefox browser. And in fact, uh, you know, there's a history. They were, they were basically the inventors of the internet. So I'm not anti-technology, but there's n inside those walls, there's nobody who knows more how leaky and vulnerable we all are right now than the people who are actually making technology. And I think we need an education that's about not technology as a thing, but technology is something that empowers and disempowers, empowers bad guys as well as good guys, that can be incredibly unequitable, right? That to think that you can do STEM, science, technology, engineering, and, math and mathematics over here, and it's not connected to world issues, what a terrible thing to say about STEM. Right? People say, oh, the poor humanities. Humanities are going to do fine. Human issues are going to be fine. If we make a science so isolated from human values, we're going to have people saying, doesn't matter. Science, there's science deniers, climate deniers, there's climate acceptors. Right? I mean, there's lots of ethical, moral, social issues that we have to reintegrate with how we do science and vice versa. In other words, knowledge has to be, those professions of the 18, 1890s, the silos of the 1890s, worked when you were inventing professions. They don't work in the world that we live in today. So Kathy, another really important theme in the book is uh, the centrality of equity in thinking about the new education. Um, and for you, that means, I think, two core values. One is access. And there's a cost dimension to that, for sure. Uh, but also, what I would characterize as a a preference for a focus on success as opposed to failure. Um, oh, well, that's interesting. Could you say more about that? Well, enabling, enabling all students ah. to, to, to thrive in our institutions oh, yeah. of education. Thank you. As opposed to structures that may focus on weeding people out. That's like one of my, I think that's really core. So when Charles Elliott and his friends are inventing the modern university, this is, you know, they're working with the industrialists of the 19th century, otherwise known as robber barons, I mean, right? That they're building Johns Hopkins, they're building Stanford, they're building the University of Chicago, they're building all of the professional schools and the medical schools at the time, uh, and the uh, yeah, professional schools at the time. Who were they influenced by? Which thinkers were they influenced by? Three big ones. Uh, for, for ideas of how you grade human beings, Francis Galton, right? Francis Galton, is a major eugenicist. Francis Galton was British, he's a cousin of Darwin's, who thought aristocrats should be paid to reproduce and poor people should be sterilized. Um, who do they think about for meritocracy? If you've read Lani Guineer's amazing book, The uh, Tyranny of Meritocracy, she talks about these origins as well. Who are they reading for um, selectivity? and why you can't just have children of Harvard going to Harvard, but you need really rigorous selection? They're reading Herbert Spencer, social Darwinist. Right? If you're talking about outputs, how you measure knowledge. In the past, you measured knowledge by writing essays, by talking to people. The professor would talk to people. Suddenly, now you've got standardized testing and IQ testing. Friend, um, Frederick Winslow Taylor, the great theorist of productivity in pig iron factories. right? Elliot and, and uh, Taylor are writing back and forth about how you can be as efficient in measuring intelligence for humans as you are for productivity for pig irons. What does that leave out? The arts, right? Uh, what does that leave out? Creativity? What does that leave out? People whose kind of intelligence doesn't fit in those patterns 
of what counts as academic pre-professional education? Right? There's a whole world. So if you're Newton, you're an alchemist, you're a scientist, you're a theologian, because you're an educated person. Right? Those things don't go together um, after the modern, the, the modern education. You're allowed to be one thing, and you're allowed to be a specialist, and you're evaluated by specialists. That leaves out huge swaths um, of human capability. Um, also, I think one of the real things I talk about in the book is not only do you leave out huge, huge important swaths of what humans have to offer, um, but at the same time that higher education is becoming more and more governed by rankings uh, for all kinds of reasons that I also talk about in the book but have to do with the way education is financed, um, secondary school becomes de facto pre-college. So that there are many, many, many fewer, this happened in the 70s and 80s, many fewer vocational programs in our high schools. So there are fewer and fewer tracks for a successful adult life. So one of the things I talk about in the book is how much we can, every university, and that even includes Harvard, and that even includes Stanford, and it even includes Duke, can learn from community colleges. Um, and I don't know if you want me to say why I think that's the case, or if you want to, if I'm... Well, I, let me maybe give yeah. you an opportunity to talk about that this way. Um, the book is just filled with discussion of examples of innovation in higher education. Many in community colleges, some in uh, larger public yeah. institutions, some in, in private universities like Duke. Yeah. Um, and what cuts, cuts across most of those examples, maybe all of them, there, there is a problem-centered focus. Uh, uh, to the uh, integration of research, inquiry, experience, and, and learning, um, a, a movement across disciplinary boundaries. All, all of this is quite familiar to many people at Duke. Um, how far would you push this? So the, the, how much does the new education need to completely transform the old? What would we keep? So I actually, I think one of the biggest problems with our current education system is that we do have a hierarchy that ranks everyone by a standard that may not be the standard that's right for your students, the community you're addressing, and where you're at. So I think the first way to address that question is to say there's no one size fits all. Being very introspective about who you're serving and why and what your mission is that determines that answer. So people will often say to me, you give all these models, but I don't see one that's exactly me. And I always say, good. So take those models and think about how they can inspire you to ask the same questions that the people who I, uh, someone called it um, just on Twitter today, evidence-based optimism. And there is a kind of evidence-based optimism in the book because I do go around and meet lots of people who are doing remarkable things at every university, some are at Duke and Stanford and Harvard, and some at LaGuardia Community College, Bronx Community College, uh, I think Borough of Manhattan Community College, other community colleges around the country, and every, every possible institution in between. But the, there's no one size fits all, because students, so somebody used a phrase recently that I really love, the people in our classrooms who are students, instead of thinking about students, to think about the people in our classroom who are students. Because that demo the demography of who makes up your student body is radically different from one school to the next. Who are they? Why are they coming to your institution? What are they looking for? And what are the things that you can offer to students to come so that, and this goes back to your, that great question, so that they can be successes from wherever they start to wherever they end up in a way that they're determining. One of the things I think I, I've said this several times, and I really feel is it's almost a kind of child abuse that we're inflicting on young people now. And there's not a university in the country that doesn't know that they're spending far more money now than they ever have before on mental health facilities at their schools. I think we're doing that to young people. We're making students feel, first of all, summative end of grade testing is like the stupidest way to learn. Right? We know that success on multiple choice tests prepares you to be a success on multiple choice tests. Right? And anyone who's taught a child anything 
knows that if you have a two-year-old and you're teaching your two-year-old something, you don't give the child a B plus, right? And then say, okay, here's your B plus, done, right? It's a ridiculous way if you're thinking about learning to measure how we knowledge, measure how, what knowledge somebody's gaining. So rather than a one size fits all, I think you have to figure out who those students are, why they're coming to your institution, and really be introspective about are you doing everything you can to make sure that's possible. So the phrase I use in the book, and this is a phrase that gets used in lots of different ways by different people, the way I'm using the phrase student-centered learning is to think about a university instead of being credential-centered, which is you get your test scores, in order to get into a certain school, in order to get a certain kind of GPA, in order to uh, graduate from that school, to think of that as the beginning rather than the, than the end of an educational process. That what you're really educating people for is not to get a diploma, but to use that diploma and have all the tools from that diploma that they can use for absolutely everything else in their life. Because that life is going to change, and it could change 15 minutes after they graduate, or it could change 15 years after they graduate, but I don't have to tell anyone in this room whether they were born before 1993 or after, that life throws us all curveballs all the time. Right? And if we tell students that in those 112 summative, high-stakes tests they take between kindergarten and college, America t tests earlier and more often than any other country on the planet, uh, if we tell them that that score on that test means something, that's a lie. It's just a lie. And no wonder they're freaked out. Young people are feeling stressed and freaked out because they know it's a lie, right? I mean, who, who really believes that a test score um, is everything in a, in a life? Um, so I don't think there's one, I don't think there's one way there are many, many, many different ways. And in fact, this year I'm doing a lot of keynote speeches and all of that stuff. And next year I'm only going to places where people have read the new education to get ideas, but then they're going to focus on a problem. And students, faculty, and administrators who can make change are all working together on a problem. And then we'll talk about, and I've got many of these lined up already, um, talk about what, how I can help people think through their ideas to get to some kind of an actual implementation and workable solution. The good news and why I'm evident, I have some evidence-based um, optimism, I've heard from the departments of education from Sri Lanka, Scotland, um, uh, many different, Canada, and probably 10 different universities a day, plus students, it's kind of astonishing how many people think we need to do something. I think we're at a tipping point. I think everywhere there are places, like many of the programs at Duke. And I also think there's around the periphery of every university, amazing things are happening. And how you take that periphery and make it more central, again, depends on how brave you are, what your mission is, who your students are, and whether you think you're succeeding or failing. Right? Some people may say, we are perfect. There's not a thing to change. Well, Kathy, I have, I have many other questions for you. But um, I'd like to give you an opportunity now to engage our audience okay. with, uh, with one of the patented Davidson discussion <laughs> exercises. Um, it, okay. And, so every, and, and then we'll do that for a bit, and then we'll, we'll open it up to questions from you. Okay, so this is actually um, just because I think often we feel like we're beaten down, and what we know about the classroom is sadly the classroom replicates many of the social hierarchies of everyday life, right? Shy people don't talk as much in the classroom. Women don't talk as much in the classroom. People of color don't talk as much in the classroom. There are all kinds of things that determine, and sociologists of education go through with stopwatches. This is, you know, this is not made up. This is, there's lots of stuff on this. So I'm very influenced in by a whole range of what are called inventory techniques, which are every class I teach and every lecture I give, there's some moment where every person in the room gets to have an idea and share that idea and hear themselves talk. So this takes three minutes. Uh, they have all of the pencil and a piece of paper, uh, an index card. I often use index cards for the ritual of it. I just want you now on your index card, Nine, this, the first part, of, this is a three-part ex, little exercise. We'll start for 90 seconds. If you, right now, were all powerful, and 
and you could change. Not How many people are from Duke in the audience? How many people are not from Duke in the audience? OK, so let's say whatever institution you want to define, if it's Duke, make it Duke. If it's not Duke, a diff, your, other, your own institution. Three things, 90 seconds, top of your head. I am all powerful. I am the queen or king of this institution. What three things would I change first? 90 seconds, I'm going to just time you. What three things would you change first? Just write it down as fast as you can. 90 seconds. So part two of this is I want you to turn to somebody you did not walk in with or that you don't know. Turn to somebody you don't know. And I want you to do this in a very ritualized fashion. This is 90 seconds again. One person reads from their card. Don't explain. Just read from your card. The other person is silent. Listening is something that we don't do very well in higher education. Then switch. Let the second person read. Then, after you've each heard each other, think about something that you might want to share with the whole group. Okay? Again, 90 seconds. You might want to revise. You might say, ooh, I like your idea better. You might want to work it out. But somehow come up with one thing you're going to share and write that out. 90 seconds, find somebody. Talk it through again and make sure you do the one person speaks, one person listens, and then take turns. 90 seconds. So we could all leave right now because actually that exchange is the most important thing that happened in this room right now. We have lots of research on what people remember. It goes all the way back to Dewey. People only remember about 8% of the content in a class. Last year, not last year, three years ago, a very famous prep school that shall be unnamed. I was naming them for a while, and they said, please don't. So they shall be unnamed. Did a mean thing where the first day of class in September, they gave each of their students, this is a top five very expensive, very famous prep stool. They gave each of their students the exact same final exam and all of their subjects that they'd given to those same exact students, not average doubting. The exact same students took the exact same tests in September that they had taken in May. The average grade in May was about a 90, 92. The av- Can anyone guess? You've pro- if you saw me on C-SPAN, you saw this already. Do you know what the final gra- the grade was in September? Top, top five prep school in the country? Already, you're closer. It was in the 50s. Top five school in the country. They completely freaked out. If I'd been there, I would have said, actually, what you've taught your students is that in a crisis, they can work really, really hard, and they're A students. They can get A's in a crisis. Right? But content is not the issue. What we know and what we just did, and this it's called an inventory method. In any inventory method where you have students actually do something, where they interact with an idea, is six months, months from now the most likely thing you will remember is that you did that. Whatever you put on the card at the end, you will 100% of you will remember that was your idea. <laughs> I think it was great. But that's what knowledge is, right? You learn the world by how you take all the information in the world and figure out what's relevant to you. Um, we could collect those cards. or I, Maybe before the Q&A, do we want to have just a few? Does anyone want to sh- shout out what they wrote on their card together, what they and their partner wrote on their card? Yes, please. Thank you. Seminars actually are, as if anything, they're even more prejudicial to people in the classroom than lectures are. Faculty say that 100% of students speak in a seminar when 20% do. When you get to the 20% level, uh, we've got to get sociologists of education. When, you, when 20% of your students talk, you come out and say, wow, everyone talked today. Right? What that means is it's awful to ask a question and have no one answer. So if someone answers, right, you're so happy. And it's usually somebody who's kind of a big mouth, right? And there's always, it's, there's another 20% that actually I find, this is the one that haunts me. It's actually about 18%. 18% of students who graduate from college say that unless they were called on, they never once spoke in a classroom. Abolish traditional academic departments huh? in favor of problem-centered learning. Great. And Bass Connections is, I talk about Bass Connections, the book. That's what that does. 
That's a very, um, that would be the most radical thing to do. Uh, you have some fights on your hands. Um, but imagine, even if you spent, I mean, I once, I think in Duke Magazine, on the 25th anniversary issue, we were all asked, what would you do? And I said, I, what if we just for a year, I think this is what I said, um, what if for a year we got rid of all departments and just talk, focused on problems, if only to see who we would meet on campus that we don't normally meet? I once taught a class at Duke that was organized by building. Students had to go into a building on campus that they didn't normally go in and do an ethnography of everybody in the building. Faculty, students, housekeeping staff. One of my students came back and said, did you know in Allen Building, there are these tiny little rooms that the housekeeping staff has, sits in? They have little stools in there. Did you know, did you know at night there are people walking around buildings cleaning those buildings? Did you know? I was like, thank you. You did the, you did the assignment. Right? But to think about how you could reorganize a university, that's an amazing experiment to do that. It would be, everybody would learn so much if for a year. And what's interesting is often we as academics who succeed in our professions often succeed by doing things far more interesting and radical and unconventional than what the structures of our departments are. That's weird. Right? There are reasons for that, but it's strange. It's strange. Right? You know, that we make that flip. Uh, anyone have another one? OK, I'm one of the like big mouths in the classes, so I like to share. But we're both pre-med, so our collective idea was to like a complete overhaul of the pre-med prerequisites for undergrads, which, like many of the paradigms that you've already talked about, hasn't changed in like 100 years since the Flexner report came out. Yep, and in fact, I'm working with both the American Bar Association and the American Medical Association on changing medical school and law school. Those are two of the people who turned up in my inbox. So not only do we need to change pre-med major, but we have to change medical school. And in fact, this method this, um, that we're using, it's called Think, Pair, Share. I first learned it from a second grade teacher, and then I also saw it used on Grand Rounds in medical school. Right? I also used it when one of our boards of trustee members was the head of Cisco, uh, CEO of Cisco, and he had me come in and do a workshop for the CEOs uh, that were constituent companies of Cisco. And I did this with them, and he loved it because he said, there's no more uniformity on Earth, no greater uniformity on Earth than when the CEO is in the room. You never find out what people are really thinking. The thing about an inventory method is not only does everyone speak, they don't all say the same thing. Imagine that, right? All of our education is about, like, aping your professor, right? Mimicking your professor, learning expertise, because faculty don't learn how to teach. In graduate school, you don't learn how to teach. You learn how to do research. And then your best students learn to do research the way you do research, right? So that's that self-replication that's credentialized. And that's what pre-med school is about. But interestingly, the head of the AMA in charge with, charged with medical education for the AMA is interested in changing medical school. You know, so, so it'll, I, I, I'm with you. <laughs> I, I, may have, I may have heard, actually, uh, what Kathy put on her invisible card about how we might change doctoral education. Um, can we turn to questions now from, from the audience? So how do we tilt against the uh, pressures for credentialing as the point? You know, we have societal pressures, we have parental pressures, we have student pressures, and, you know, the question is, are we slipping this in like, you know, vegetables into the meatloaf when they're not noticing? Or <laughs> is this something that we, you know, sort of boldly say, this is not the point of the education, and how do we convey that and actually change our classroom practices to tilt against that? I think that we, change, we, ha we need change on every level from classroom practices. So one reason I use this inventory method is because I think we all need a win. So it's a way to get started and get a conversation started, also in the most cantankerous, awful faculty meeting. And boy, there's some, a good, there's some doozies out there. This is a way also of equalizing what happens and actually finding that people who act like they hate each other might actually have some things in common. But they don't know because of how those hierarchies play out. That gets replicated on every level all the way up. Um, as an institution, and you're a provost, so this is your, you know, you have a, and you're a vice provost, these are really serious issues because you've got a whole institutional tradition in your hands. And I take that very seriously. 
I think, again, it depends on your institution. So Hampshire College is one of the examples in the book. Two years ago, uh, now it probably is five years ago now. They said, well, we were founded in the 70s to be innovative, and we don't feel like we're doing our job anymore. Not only will we not look at SATs and ACT scores, we will not allow those to be recorded in any way. What that means is they no longer are allowed to be in the US News and World Report rankings. That was a pretty friggin' bold thing for a president to say, we don't care about the rankings. In fact, they, it takes them out of all kinds of ranking system. We don't care. We know this is who we are. It's not who Duke is. It's who we, Hampshire College is. Now, it's turned out fantastically well for Hampshire College. They're getting more of the kind of students that they wanted. They, everybody is happier. They're finding the selection process actually is bringing them the kinds of students they want. It's a more diverse student body, and it's been a phenomenal success. I don't know what the equivalent is for Duke. Certainly things like the programs like Bass Connections, where people actually get to try something out and say, oh, wow, I thought that was charlatanism. But it turned, a word I've been accused of many times in my career. But um, actually, it turns out that's a pretty interesting way to know. And in fact, that's more aligned with my research as a as famous professor than what I'm teaching in my introductory courses. Um, Yale this year and the history department changed its whole history program. So it now has two kinds of, you can be a history major in two different ways. One is I want to go on and be a history professor at Yale. Even that one has changed because they've reorganized all of the questions um, in the history department with a global emphasis. So even if you're in a field and nation specific area, there has to be a global component to it which I think is amazing. Um, and then there's another track for anybody who thinks, wow, we live in a pretty complicated world, and maybe knowing some history might help us solve, this pro solve our problems. History is now the number one major at Yale for the first time since 2000, the year 2000. Before that, it was economics. It's edged out economics as a major at Yale. That might not work for other places. But, and it turns out, um, after I, I blogged about that, after I interviewed people in, at, at Yale and found out about that, the AHA said, wait, 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 wait. 123 universities are part of our retooling the history discipline initiative and thinking through these ideas. That's why I'm an evidence-based optimist. People are trying to do things. Now, redesigning history is different than saying we're never going to, we're not going to even allow ACT and SAT scores again. But at every university, there's something major you can do. Um, and clearly, Duke is already doing some of those things, many of those things, and maybe there's even a place to do more. But how you, so for Hampshire, Hampshire's mission is to be different and to be Hampshire. So getting rid of the SATs and ACTs fits with its mission. That's the kind of deep introspective questions I think that people have to ask as leaders, collectively, and as students. Interesting, pre-med students probably are not um, intellectual lightweights, and you've probably got some pretty good ideas, I bet. I'm just guessing. I'm guessing if you could have written for an hour, you would have told us how to change the major. That kind of, that's another thing inventory methods do, is they give you insights into people's ideas, the ideas you might not have had. Right. Whether in a classroom or in a bigger, a bigger circumstance. I've done Think Pair Share, by the way, with 6,000 international baccalaureate teachers in the Philadelphia 76ers Auditorium. It works in any size group. Um, Duke is famous for having mostly small classes. 75% of all classrooms are under 25 students or whatever. I can't remember what we used to say, but something like that. So you don't need that. But even at huge universities, you can use some of these methods so that people can actually have some ideas that are heard. Um, my name is Nicole Kempton, and I'm um, with the Alumni Association, and I oversee graduate and professional school engagement. Um, and something that I think about all the time is that university, that institutional tradition um, doesn't just sit with academic departments. Um, it's also a lot of the business units that support the work of the university, you know, everything from HR to student affairs to the career center to alumni affairs. Um is, is kind of in the traditional model very siloed. And um, we have a real opportunity, I think, if we were able to um, collaborate more closely to really unleash the full potential of our community. 
Um, do you have any thoughts on that or are there any, Many. um, <laughs> institutions that do that particularly well? I'm now at a unionized university. I love it beyond words. Um, and often administrators have a, uh, and I mean, people who work in alumni office, et cetera. I often go into meetings and don't know if I'm talking to faculty or administrators. Um, that's not necessarily a, a concomitant of unionization, and I know at Duke that's kind of, kind of a, a difficult and, and tender word right now. Um, but um, definitely I'm in situations all the time now where so-called staff or administrators are present. And I actually, when I said I'm only next year working in programs where there's students, faculty, and administrators, I mean also the Alumni Association and the uh, you know, other people who have a vested interest in the institution who are dedicated to the institution should be in that room. Because it's often, if you're at so-called peripheries, you have a much clearer view um, than if you're in what seems to be the center. So yes, I think that's, I think in fact, uh, I can't remember the numbers anymore. I think at Duke at one point, uh, I'm forgetting. What, what percentage of workers at the university are non-faculty? I think it's like 80% are non-faculty, is that right? 80% of the, of the people who work full-time at Duke are not faculty. Might be higher even than that. That's crazy not to take advantage of that intelligence and that dedication and that mission at your university, right? That's silly. And it's, all, it's false, right? A university is many, many things. No student who's fortunate enough to come to a residential college. And this book is not just about traditional 18 to 22-year-old residential students, but also about students returning to college. But no one comes just for the classroom. And in fact, when I interviewed hundreds, th probably thousands of students, Often what they would say were the most important things they learned were not what they learned in the classroom, but through individual projects, through the smartest roommates and the conversations they had uh, with roommates. Um, people would say all kinds of things that had nothing to do with the actual physical classroom. Yeah, thank you. You mentioned a number of individuals have emailed you about ideas of helping to come and innovate and disrupt education. Can you share the top three themes that you've heard through those particular inquiries that you've gotten thus far? Departments. How you can loosen the tyranny of the departmental, disciplinary, and um, division structure of universities. I mean, I don't think anybody lives in our world without realizing how connected things are. Right? And that it's hard to make those connections in any level, right? Intellectually, um, as faculty, Right? I mean, you can teach at a university 40 years and not know people in the next building or in the next hallway if they're not in your department. Right? Um, assessment. I don't think there's any person in America right now except maybe the people who do the Kaplan after school testing, which is a many, many billion dollar industry. Um, I don't think there's anybody that's happen is happy with so-called outputs oriented evaluation. Uh, to how to bring down cost. That one's, you know, that's different for pro for private and public schools. Um, uh, but there are, are there are things that can happen. But those are those I would say are the biggest ones. But but the people who write me are often concerned about um, how. So from students, I hear a lot from students. Um, there's a at the end of the book I interview. A bunch of students who all happen to be nieces and nephews and their girlfriends and, and boyfriends who were at my uh, in-laws house for, uh, I think it was Thanksgiving, right before the book came out. And I just changed the last page. So I said, OK, well, here's this th theory. What do you think? I sh how should I end the book? And they said, basically, what we want is something in our college education. It's how to be an adult 101. I said, I'd like that class. I'd like to take that class, right? But basically, it's how you make the connection, because we're terrible at it. I would say impoverished at it. We're terrible at making a connection between the content-based, disciplinary, testable education we learn in the classroom and how I can apply this elsewhere. What, what can I do with this elsewhere? Um, one question I sometimes ask my students when I'm doing inventory methods, there's something called an exit ticket. 
that you have students in the 90 seconds before they leave a classroom for that day to write something down. And my favorite question, I learned this, I learned everything from my students. I, I don't think there's a thing in the book that I invented myself. I learned everything from my students. But one of the things I now ask is, what did we talk about in class today that might even keep you awake at night? And if we didn't talk about anything today that might keep you awake at night, what's the question I've, that I, as the professor, forgot to ask? What's the question that would keep you awake and that is bothering you? That's an amazing thing to happen. And that kind of um, relevance, it, it used to be called relevance, but it's a bigger thing than relevance. Like, how is this education going to serve me after I graduate? Um, for a while, all these um, state legislators who were busy axing um, universities, which is why public education costs so much, and often axing what they thought of as frills. We're talking about skills training, saying we have to make people workforce ready. That is so bogus and so unrealistic in the world we live now. But I do think we have to make people world ready. And world ready in the sense of having some tools for comprehending how you cope with trauma, with disaster, how you organize. How you get a voice in a community when you think there's no way to speak out at all. When you know there's injustice, and you know you have to have a voice against injustice. And if you kneel at a football game, the President of the United States well might say, well, we're going to take away the tax status from, your team, from the NFL because you knelt at a football team. How do you deal with those huge, huge moral and ethical issues that seem like they're up here? And then suddenly they're, oh my goodness, I'm looking in the mirror, and this is my life now. How do I make those decisions? Those are really important questions. And I think higher education can do a much better job at answering those kinds of questions. You mentioned this idea of the biggest problem um, being hierarchy, um, and that universities need to be finding out what the students are looking for. And right now, it's kind of, um, we have these major requirements and modes of inquiry and areas of knowledge that we have to fulfill. And it's an attempt to try to give us a well-rounded course load. But in order to, I guess, figure out how we can tell the university what we're looking for. How would you suggest creating a relationship between kind of the powers that be at Duke and the students so we can let them know what we want out of our education and what kind of courses we're looking for and what we want to learn? Well, we've got some pretty powerful administrators right here now. So I don't know if I would um, uh, come up with something that they wouldn't. But I think forums on how you connect. I mean, I think the concept of modes of inquiry and what was the other one again? Areas of knowledge. Areas of knowledge. Those are great concepts. I think if I were having a forum, I'd want to ask, and I'd want to use inventory methods to do it, and maybe small cell groups where I'd send people away to work on certain problems, um, is to ask, do those modes of inquiry really teach you different modes of inquiry, or do they allow you to fill a course requirement called modes of inquiry course requirement? That's the basic, that's the distinction. That's the difference between workforce ready, world ready, credential centered, student centered. Okay. Is this a name we're giving for something that's really about credentialing? Or is the credentialing something that also helps us think about what the purpose of that is in, in our lives? That happens often in individual classes. Some professors are far more attuned to that than others. Um, and it happens for individual people. It often doesn't happen enough on an institutional level, where we have those connectors, where we can figure that out. The other thing Yale did um, for its history program, which is fascinating, is every history pro student has a cohort class that they take together that's sort of an introductory, big, broad class that they all take together. And it's not the stupid kind of old-fashioned great books where you pretend that Shakespeare only wrote one play. and. Socrates only wrote one dialogue, and Plato only wrote one dialogue, and Toni Morrison wrote only one novel, you know, where you, everybody, oh, we all have to read the same book at the same time, and then we'll be a community. That's just, that's bankrupt, in my, in my subtle opinion. Um, but to have everybody who is starting a year together with some general course where they do have something to talk, and, and part of what Yale has built in is that that course will change, that cohort course, but you're with a cohort where you can make those connections, where you're in one class where other classes, you do many different things, but then one class where you're all together. I hope in the fantasy version, in my fantasy version, I'm a good PR person for Yale History Department these days, but in my fantasy version um, uh, of that, 
one thing that happens in that cohort class is people constantly making connections between everything you're doing at the university and what you're learning in that sort of core course that you're taking each year. Um, you know, that's a pretty simple structural change. Sometimes there are simple changes. A person I interviewed um, from Harvard on the last page of the book, um, I said, okay, w what would you change about your Harvard education? He said, I want to go on for a JD, PhD, and there's so many riches here. And I was, I couldn't, I couldn't take a class outside of my area of expertise as much as I wanted to because I knew I'd get a B in it instead of an A+. Plus. And that meant I would not get into the program he ended up getting into, the Yale JD um, PhD program. Right. All that would have to be is a pass-fail option. You know, that's not hard. That is not hard. There are certain, so there are structural things you can change, there are intellectual things that you can change, and then there's everyday life things you can change. There's also that whole thing of, uh, I know Duke had that system of, they're like little courses, one credit courses in dorms that students house learn. Courses. House courses. House courses. House courses, not little. But little in the sense of not four credits, but small credit courses. You know, I think there are ways that students themselves could be activists and, and make those kind of connections happen. Hi, I'm Lee Chen Chen in Student Affairs. Um, I'm wondering if you can comment about the um, role of education in terms of cultivating citizenship, whether it's domestic citizenship as well as global citizenship. I think a lot of times, especially what happened these days, is really people out for their self-interest. Everybody's looking out for themselves. But is there a role in terms of education to help promote this collective thinking or um, the greater goods? So for the last 40 years in higher education, we've been in a, in a real downward trajectory, both in defund, defunding public education and um, emphasizing so-called workforce readiness and putting more and more and more emphasis on how your life is over and you're a failure if you don't go to Harvard or Stanford and your backup school Duke. I said that to be provocative. I taught here 25 years, and I'm a big, you know, I'm a dookie. But that, you know, so I've said that to be as, as provocative as I could be. That whole mentality leads to a kind of sense of self-interest. So does the high cost of education, right? In other words, if I'm paying $60,000 a year in tuition, room and board, books, fees, et cetera, et cetera, and my family doesn't have $60,000 a year to just throw out the window. By which I mean that's not, it's not that it's useless. It's incredibly important, important but you, if you're not rich enough where $60,000 does not matter, no wonder you're going to try to go into a field that will help you recoup loans, whether they're actual tuition-based monetary loans or a sense of responsibility to those who have made whatever sacrifices need to be made in order that you can have an elite education. And that's true even, that's true for public schools as well. Um, since now, especially out of state public tuition is almost as high as private, tu private school tuition. So as soon as tuition rises, as soon as you're focusing more and more on selectivity, as soon as you're even more and more saying the only people that are going to succeed in this world are people who have elite educations. And the more and more we count the success of education as income, what your net income is afterwards, the more you can't have citizenship. So for example, everybody does studies about how college, a college degree today isn't as worth as much as it used to be because the net income of college graduates is lower. That, direct, that, if, that is absolutely not the case if you factor out gender. There are uh, proportionally about 10% more women in colleges now than were in colleges 20 years ago. Guess what professions women most likely go into? The four so-called feminized professions. Teaching, healthcare, librarianship, um, what am I forgetting? Teaching, oh, social work. There is currently in this country a teacher shortage in 50 out of 50 states. 50 out of 50 states. If we were all good capitalists, we would believe that teaching should be a very high paying profession. 50, there's a teacher shortage in 50 out of 50, right? Supply and demand, 
right? That's how racism and sexism and pre all kinds of prejudices get cooked into the system. It's not an educational pro problem, it's a social problem. And I think we've seen the devolution of that, and I'd like to think that people are saying, whoa, we kind of got ourselves into a bad, a bad situation here, and we have to start thinking again what the value of a college education is. And maybe the value of a college education shouldn't be just what your net income is going to be when you graduate. You shouldn't feel like a failure if you go into something you love, but it doesn't make an enormous amount of money. But that also, that's got a whole lot of other concomitants that go with it.